Moving to questions for the Minister for Finance, I welcome the Minister to his first question time and I call Philip Smith. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, question number one, Minister. Um, uh, Philip. Um, uh, Philip, you and I had this dance in my card previously, but it's always a good sign when someone late, late in proceedings comes back for a, another dance, so no doubt we will continue this discussion around corporation tax into the future. Uh, I am absolutely confident that a, corp that a corporation tax rate of 12.5 per cent from April 2018 is affordable, and I am pleased that we are making good progress towards that goal. My department has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Treasury, with HMRC, to put the administrative preparations in place. And I have written to the British Chancellor, Mr Osborne, seeking to increase the pace of discussions on the deduction to the block grant. I intend to get the best deal possible for all the people we represent, no matter where they come from, and minimise the cost to the block grant. Over the summer, the Executive will prepare a multi-year budget with resource DL plans to 1920. It is planned to present a draft uh, budget to the Assembly in the autumn. Uh, which will reflect estimated costs for a corporation tax rate of 12.5 per cent from April 2018. Uh, what I would add is that, uh, having, having combed over this issue in the last week, there's a couple of things that are clear to me. One is that uh, the majority in this House has resolved, the vast majority, to deliver a corporation tax. The date and the rate has been set. The vast majority are confident and have faith in my ability to lead our, our top negotiation team with the Chancellor to make sure that we don't come short on the deal, that the reduction to the block grant is as small as we can make it. And I hope, I hope and trust that I have the good wishes and good will of every member of the House in that onerous task. Philip Smith for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer, uh, and no doubt we'll, we'll dance on this issue uh, again. But uh, the Minister has previously said that Corporation tax reduction cannot be confirmed until the secondary benefits have been, been negotiated with the Treasury. Was this issue not confirmed in the so-called fresh start agreement because the wool was pulled over the executive's eyes, or did the executive genuinely drop the ball in this crucial detail? Um, uh, I, I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. Um, I, I, I hark back to Trevor Lunn and don't despair, and I say to the opposition of Rio Las Concordia, have faith. Uh, I am confident we will stay absolutely resolute uh, in faith with the, good, the, good, the Fresh Start Agreement and the Stormont House Agreement. I am confident we will deliver to this House and to our people uh, a, a deal on corporation tax which is fair and proportionate. I am also confident that when we enter negotiations that they will be tough. Uh, when you see the agenda being led uh, by Mr Osborne and his colleagues, we know that when it comes to matters monetary that they are ruthless, that they will fight. To, to get the best deal for London, but I can assure you that I will try to get the best deal for Ballymena, Ballymurphy, for Fermanagh and Derry. And the only thing that I would add is that I know in your original question you asked when, when would we decide that the deal has been cut. Uh, I think that we play our cards close to our chest, but I'm confident, I'm highly confident that we will get a deal which I will be proud and pleased to bring to this House. Aaron, sir, Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you. Um, sorry for cutting in on, the, on this uh, dance. It is worrying that every time we've gone into these negotiations, we've come out with something uh, a little bit weaker. But does the minister agree that having a, a well-trained and well-skilled workforce is essential to capitalise on the benefits of low co corporation tax? And would he agree that reinstating uh, investment in higher education would be a priority to achieve this? Well, I, I thank Gwen Pwihis Lesson Wal Faustus Kesh Saki. I thank the member for her question, and I agree with her when she says that what we are trying to do is deliver high value jobs. High value jobs require a skilled workforce. My, my uh, discussions with both, both vice chancellors have been very active over recent weeks. We are all, we're all on the same page that for a corporation tax to succeed, it cannot succeed alone. We need to deliver the infrastructure, and you know. If you will ask Concordia, the resources we put in the infrastructure and our commitment in capital budgets. But we need also to sort out skills and education in the monitoring round. I think I made a good start to that. I think I showed our resolve and determination. Uh, but what I would say to, to the member and to, to, to the entire House is that we need to make sure that the jobs we bring, bring in 
are, are life-changing jobs. They are sustainable jobs. They are best-in-class jobs. And for that to happen, we need to get fully behind uh, the, two, the two main universities, but more than two universities, of course. But we need to get behind our, our universities who want to deliver those top-class graduates. The Minister, I'm sure, will not need reminding that the Treasury quite often operates as a law unto themselves, so I, I welcome his commitment to fight ferociously for the best deal possible, a fair deal uh, for our, our Assembly. Uh, could the Minister perhaps outline as well uh, not only the negotiation up until we get the 12.5 per cent, but it could remind the House what we will have after we do secure a fair deal on corporation tax. Well, uh, I thank the member for that question. I am aware that his constituency has perhaps been dealt more hammer blows with the closure of major manufacturers over recent years in the plan closure. So I know his interest in corporation taxes is fuelled by only one issue. And it's the only reason that we want to reduce the rate of corporation tax. That is to create thousands of jobs. Um, and, and while the figures are there of, of uh, by, by, by 2030 over 30,000 jobs, new jobs, I think really we should reduce it to, to the individual. And on Friday last, I met a young man, Thomas, at the bottom of the shankle, seeking work. Uh, this morning, I, I met uh, young graduates who have started PwC down at the waterfront. And for every young person to whom we can offer a job, a, a, a well-paid job, a sustainable job, rather than offering what was the emigrant boat, and which was now the, the European to Canada or Australia. So I say to the member, yes, we think it will increase output at least 8.5 per cent. Yes, we think it will be a, a dramatic st step change, but I think we should reduce it to the individual, to every single person to whom we will be able to give that the dignity of employment because we reduce corporation tax. I call Chair of the Committee, Emma little Pengel. I welcome the clarity given by uh, the, the Minister in relation to the certainty around uh, corporation tax. Certainly Northern Ireland needs a game changer and I think this is the real opportunity to actually change that game for the better for so many of our young people here. It was hard fought for and it was hard won in terms of the certainty around that. But does the Minister agree with me that when negotiations continue in relation to secondary effects that it is important that the rest of the executive are out there selling this prospect to businesses to come into Northern Ireland to ensure that this does become the game changer that it has the potential to be. Well, 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 I thank the chair for her question, and, and I think one thing that she touches on is that this isn't a spectator sport. That there is a role for every politician, every business leader, every community, community leader to show the proposition that we offer uh, investors and the proposition we offer indigenous companies who want to make a further investment. As we move forward and we, we bring our, 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 our best game. Uh, to the negotiations with Treasury. I am confident that the points you make uh, about the bright future we envisage for all our people, that that is something that has to be put front and central. The Treasury has to understand that, in fact, a prosperous uh, society here should mean, will mean, that uh, we do not have to uh, go back to Treasury and ask them to support the many, many projects we wish to, we wish to fund from our own corporation tax resources in the time ahead. And I'm confident, I'm confident that while there will be a reduction in the block grant, of course, at the start, but over a number of years, I'm confident we will attract more companies here, more investment here, and the take, the take from corporation tax is going, is going to rise from the base which, which will be at when corporation tax is first reduced. Paul Jim Allister. The Minister's officials last week told the Finance Committee that the latest calculation showed that in the first year the reduction to the block grant could be £270 million. Is that affordable? Well, uh, it seems to me that actually that is the uh, Treasury calculation, and we now go into negotiations with our colleagues in Treasury, and we will decide for our people what is affordable, what is fair and proportionate. And for me, I'm not going to negotiate in this room, but everyone knows that I will be seeking the very best deal, and the Treasury knows that as well. So officials have, of course, uh, presented the modelling done by Treasury. But I say to everyone here, and I would like the support of everyone, let's challenge, let's challenge everything the, the Treasury brings to the table. Let's challenge it robustly, because the alternative, the alternative is to sit on our hands, say we can't do better, we might as well go home, and that is not my intention in these assertive and positive negotiations which we will have with Treasury in the time ahead. Sir, Ian Milne. I call Ian Milne. Question number two. 
Garamaya Boyle and Buyas Ort and Coldas and Kesh Kar. My starting point is I believe members of the Assembly are best placed to make decisions in the interest of the people who elect us. So it's no secret, a free last concordia, that I have said that I would like us to have more fiscal levers at our control uh, in, in, in this government. Uh, the transfer of corporation tax, which we have just discussed, sets an important pre precedent which I hope will spur us to take greater control of our own destiny. And, and I hark back to that in everything that we do in terms of trying to take Gillette, bless you. And everything that we do in trying to take farther powers is because I believe in the members of this House. I believe in their genius, their ability, their talent to make the right decisions when they control these fiscal levers, to make the right decisions for our electorate. And any day of the week, any day of the week, I would rather put my faith in the members of this House than put my faith in the Treasury. I call Robbie Butler. So. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, how does the Minister's desire to achieve additional fiscal powers correspond with his party's decision last year to hand our welfare powers back to Westminster? My apologies. I should have called Ian Millen for a supplementary. So can you hold that question and can I call Ian Millen for a supplementary? Jan Faber Kirby. Um I'd like to thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I would like to thank the Minister for the answer that he's given thus far. Also, congratulations to the, in your new job, and I wish you well for the future. Um, no doubt the Minister will be aware of the current VAT of 20% rate, um, and it's holding, in my opinion, back on our tourism potential. And as a Mid-Ulster MLA, I am also aware of our, our, our tourism potential with the Shimasini Centre, for example, in Balahi and lots of other uh, local attractions. So the question is, uh, can I ask the Minister for his view on VAT impacting on our, on our hospitality and our tourism sectors? Well, I have a few last few questions. I have heard that as Jeshai on Kesh Dakar, I admire the member for standing up for his rights and making sure that he got his supplementary question in, despite the ruling of the chair. Boilum Kuru, I'll court you, court your Dera Has, or Noyes, Fada, and once you talk about the I look forward to visiting the member's constituency, as he knows I have very strong South Derry roots, and look forward in particular to visit the Seamus Heaney Centre. In my opinion, the VAT rate of 20% is, is a tax on tourism. It is a burden on hospitality. If you want to see how to do it right, a free last concord, you can see what they did down south, where they reduced the uh, hospitality uh, rate to, to 9%, basically the, the tourism rate to 9%. And of course, tourism has created more jobs south of the border in the last four years than any other sector. Unfortunately, there are European rules. I, I hope those rules are still there on Friday. But European rules do not, do not allow a state to have a, a different uh, rate of ta uh, VAT within a region. That said, it is, it, 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 that said, uh, it is, it is my, it is my intention that we should control all these levers. And I mean, there's no greater example of the flexibility that the sovereign government, which is in Dublin, was able to apply a tank on recovery to tourism rates. So uh, I have no doubt that the Seamus Heaney uh, Centre will be a huge success. And I wish the hospitality industry or sector and and so Derry, every success and anything I can do to help that, you can be assured of my support. I now call Robbie Butler and thank him for his patience. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now the Minister has had time to prepare his answer. I'm going to have to think of a different question, but, but on that, I'll stick with the first one, uh, if the Minister doesn't mind. How does the Minister's desire to achieve additional fiscal powers uh, correspond with his party's decision last year to hand our welfare powers back uh, to Westminster? Thank you. Well, uh, I thank you, and I thank you for not changing the question either. But, 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 but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure why I should pull my punches or not. But of course, the, uh, maybe I won't, because it was the Ulster Unionist Party, in concert with the Conservatives, who joined forces in the 2010 election, which, which ushered in this uh, awful era of austerity, which actually is just a, a bland word for what are hardships for ordinary people, as the, as the bishops of England said, placing the heaviest burdens on those with the narrowest shoulders. So the Ulster Unionist Party should be very wary of, of uh, entering into that particular and getting into this particular scrap. But what I would say about this, that whatever, uh, whatever tactics were used 
by this House to ensure that we protected the, 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 the most vulnerable. I endorse them. We, we, we have managed to put in place the most generous mitigation package for those uh, on welfare uh, benefits for the disabled, for those who would have been faced with the bedroom tax, than any other part of this island. So you can be sure of this, when it comes to dealing with the Treasury, they know when they face this government that they face a strong adversary. I call Paul Garvin. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Just in relation to uh, fiscal powers, I appreciate that uh, VAT came about because we entered the EEC back in the 1970s, and mention was made in relation to reduction of our uh, VAT level. Is there a possibility that uh, also another tax that was brought in was the APD to deal with a green, a green tax uh, to do with our airlines in relation to that? That was only really brought about uh, to deal with uh, a green uh, taxation uh, code. Uh, if we exit from Europe, you would also support that we do away with both VAT and APD? Uh, well, point, point on, we have sort of called this in case. I thank, I thank the member for his mischievous uh, question. Uh, as minister, I'm, as a minister, I have, I'm, I'm not allowed uh, to speak on, on Brexit, so, so I won't. But uh, as, an, as an individual, I, I've told you where I'd like to be and what I hope to wake up to on, on Friday morning. Um, but what I'd say about uh, the, the, the tax regime here and about APD, if, if you really believe, and I suspect you don't, that the Tories introduced our passenger duty to protect the environment, then you did come up the leg in, in a bubble. Uh, because whatever the Greens think, and, and I know that the Greens are, were in favour of our passenger duty because they did want to uh, stop the damage to, to the environment and, and the burning, burning of, of fossil fuels, or the burning of, of, uh, of, of petrol, and, and so on, the damage, the damage to, the, to the environment. Whatever the Greens think, it's clear that the Tories introduced a tax which is OK for London. It hasn't uh, taken a, 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 anything from Heathrow's advance. But it's not. It's clearly uh, an imposition on us, and it's a. Uh, it's a. Our passenger duty is one of the. Uh, one of the taxations that certainly I think that we would look quite differently at if we if we could control it. But of course, to all these things there is a cost. Here, I'm Sir John O'Dowd. I call John O'Dowd. Yes, number three. Let me hold question number three. Well, uh, uh, I recently met Owen Murphy, TD, the Minister of State for Financial Services uh, and Public Procurement, and I have arranged to meet with Minister Michael Noonan this, uh, uh, this Wednesday in Dublin. I have also been in correspondence with Pascal Donoghue, the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, and anticipate meeting with him in, in the near future. John O'Dowd for a supplement. Uh, go on, Boyega, uh, for your answers thus far. Thank you, Minister, for your answers. Uh, what is on the agenda for your meetings with, with the Minister going into the future, given clearly, uh, I assume you'll be meeting him after the Brexit vote, which may or, may or may not change the agenda for that meeting. But certainly there is major issues of common concern uh, and common opportunity between the two jurisdictions. I was just, if you could, outline what your agenda will be. Well, you're, you're tempting me to speak about Brexit, and I'm going to resist that, because I, I'm meeting the Minister on Wednesday morning, and uh, he will ask me how's it going, and, and I will tell him it's going well. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll confine ourselves to that. Actually, I, I was think, trying to think desperately of something in your constituency, uh, Mr O'Dowd, which is on the agenda, but you'll be sure of this. The narrow water bridge uh, will be on the agenda, uh, as will the, the pledge to fund the A5. I think it was €400 million Euro originally. I, I stand to be corrected, uh, and we have reduced considerably from that. I think we're down to 70, 75 million maximum from the Irish government. Ulster Canal is certainly a project, uh, Waterways Ireland, the cross-border bodies. But I suppose the, the real issue is not one of, of asking Minister Noonan uh, what can he do for us, but what can we do together to uh, improve the, the lives of all, all the people we represent? How can cross-border cooperation between finance ministers, but also bro broader than that in, in concert with ministerial colleagues, how we can work together for the common good. And as part of that, certainly, uh, in speaking with Minister Noonan shortly after my election, I said I am a big advocate for the Belfast-Dublin economic corridor. Uh, and uh, that passes through Newry. I believe that's not in your constituency either. I'm sorry to, to relate. But I'm a, big, I'm a big advocate of the Belfast-Dublin economic corridor. So that, but I suppose it's getting to know you meeting. Uh, I hope to work very closely uh, with uh, Minister Noon and Minister Donoghue and Minister of State at uh, Murphy in the time ahead. Sir Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley.
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I certainly do welcome the Minister's answers thus far, particularly with his reference to the Narrow Water Bridge, which I'm, I'm delighted to hear about. If I could just ask the Minister to elaborate further on that, given that such a commitment has been expressed um, both in this House and with the Southern Government, are we now at a level of discussions where we can start to debate timelines, etc.? Well, I, I, I thank the member for her question. Um, I have been in Uriana. I, I was at the Narrow Water Bridge site, I suppose, last, last Friday with the, uh, with, the, with the principal deputy speaker. Um, and, and I do want to say, uh, just broadly, before I answer the question of Friol Askin Corlia, I think there's great potential in, in Uri reaching down right as far as Ross Trevor. It seems to me that it's untapped potential. Uh, it seems to me that the, the example and the exemplary uh, progress of first derivatives under Brian Conlon's leadership uh, shows us what can be achieved in that part of the world. So, take it first of all that I'm a, an ally for any attempts in that constituency to, to improve people's lives and build prosperity. But in terms of the narrow water bridge, the member may be aware that there, a report will go to the North South Ministerial Council in July, I think 7th of July. I'm not sure we've, we've, we've nailed down a date yet. And in that report, it will reflect back on the Fresh Start Agreement, which references uh, the Narrow Water Bridge, which talks about the great uh, potential to boost tourism, uh, to make it a, a cross-border, cross-community link, to really transform uh, our entire, uh, the entire way that tourists and visitors would view that part of the world, but also an enormous asset for local people. I hope when we get that report that we can get the pledges of support which were there previously, and I'm sure it, it was uh, uh, distressing for the member, as it was for all of us, that that fail because, in my view, that project should have gone ahead. European money was there, local council money was there. Uh, we had uh, both governments on board, and I think it's a matter of great uh, regret that it fell. But what I, if I can do anything um, to resuscitate, maybe the word, the project, the member can be sure that I will do that. I was heartened by the visit uh, on Friday, and Jerry Adams was there as well, and the cross-border committee. And it seems to me people have been waiting a long time, and it would be a great peace dividend for that area to deliver this particular, particular bridge. I call Ross Hussey. Question four, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, th I thank the member for his question. Uh, I have been briefed by my, by my officials on this issue, uh, and I am aware of the difficulties involved in attempting to resolve the problem. Uh, this is a long-standing issue, as, as the member knows, because there was some correspondence from you on this issue going back a considerable period, uh, and it will require due consideration. A resolution of this issue will be difficult, as it has been established in court that NIO and PSNI staff have no legal entitlement, no legal entitlement to the uh, Northern Ireland Civil Service Equal Pay Settlement. It would require significant funding, and given the already challenging departmental budgets, it is unclear where this money would come from. Any resolution would undoubtedly have to take account of the repercussive risk that other groups will also demand similar treatment as well as a serious risk of undermining the original equal pay settlement, both of which would, of course, require even more funding. I know this is an issue the member has worked very hard on, uh, and I don't think today I can bring him uh, a positive answer for the reasons outlined there. Ross Hussey for supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response so far. The Minister will be well aware of the, uh, the people concerned and the, the concerns that they have that they appear to have been overlooked and, in fact, forgotten by this Assembly. Uh, you mentioned in your response uh, a figure. Could you actually give me what the figure may be? Well, and I, and I thank you, and I, and I have much sympathy with those who are affected, because you're right, they, they, they had no part in, in ending up in the situation they did end up in. Um, and while I don't want to, to go for one figure, I have to say that if this uh, particular um, avenue, if we go down this particular avenue, really there's no saying where it will end, because the original Northern Ireland Civil Service equal pay settlement may, may unravel. There may be other groups as well as these groups who say they were left out. So it becomes a, a particularly fractious and difficult issue. And I'm going to resist putting a figure on it, but if, if you contact me after this, I'm, I'm willing to ask officials to discuss, it, discuss these issues with you. But let me say what, what Minister Sammy Wilson said uh, in response to yourself in 2013. The arguments put forward, and I know Mr Wilson is here today, so he'll be delighted that I'm quoting him. The arguments put forward by those lobbying on this issue do not change the fact that the position in terms of eligibility has been clear from the outset of the equal pay settlement, and this has now been upheld in the county court, which found that the settlement applied only to periods of service in the 11 Northern Ireland Civil Service departments, did not apply to bodies such as the NIO, PANI, PSNI. 
who had lawfully received delegation for pay matters, which was still in effect during the relevant time period. No legal liability has been established upon which to base any rationale to approve payment of the settlement to PSNI staff. So I'm sorry I can't be more positive on this issue today for the member. Sir Michaela Boy, like Michaela uh, Boy. and can I thank the Minister for his responses thus far and also welcome him to his first question time. And given, Minister, that you are only in a short time in your post, um, had you had any discussions with personnel or do you intend to regarding this matter, given that there are very serious concerns around equal pay? Gormagat. Well, Gur I, have, I haven't made it to Sirban yet. I did sneak into Derry, but I haven't made it to Sirban yet. But I'm, of course, I haven't been invited yet. So, but I do hope to be in that part of uh, the constituency as well. On this issue, uh, this is a very difficult and fraught issue because members know how tight money is. They know that uh, within budgets there are enormous pressures. Whatever committee you're on, whatever department you're on, you know that we, we, are, we are fighting against a reducing. Uh, resource budget between now and 2020, down 4.5 per cent. So we face enormous pressure. So I feel every, every symp sympathy for this. I had a full meeting of our, of our top team on this issue at 8 o'clock last, last Tuesday morning. So it was on my desk. It came up on the doorsteps that I canvassed, and I'm sure it came up on the doorsteps that, that Ms, Ms Boyle uh, canvassed. But I don't see an easy way through this because I can't imagine where we would get the money from. And if we did, we would then open this, this Pandora's box of, of claims. So great sympathy for those that are affected by it, but I don't see an easy way through. Call Paul Garvin. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I appreciate that we are working with uh, not a bottomless pit uh, of money. But irrespective of whether or not there's a legal issue, there also is a point where there's a moral uh, understanding a number of these individuals weren't aware that because they were under the civil service based in Westminster and uh, not under the Northern Ireland uh, connection, so therefore there is a difficulty. I think there is a moral understanding, and those that actually were contracted out, maybe working in other departments, who have lost out dramatically because of this. Uh, is there, there needs to be some understanding that we are going to attempt to it. Can I ask the Minister in relation to the moral perspective? Well, I, I think I could, the only thing I think I can say, and, and again, that increases my sympathy. There, there is a moral obligation, but unfortunately, sometimes a moral obligation can't be monetized. What I would say is this: I haven't made a decision. You can, you can, you can understand from the things I'm saying that I think it would be uh, very, very difficult to find any way to, to uh, find this money um, to make this settlement when there is no legal obligation. When it could open up uh, the Pandora's box of farther claims, but what I, the only thing I think I can say to Mr. Gervin is that uh, last concourse, that I haven't made a decision, but I will make an early decision. I will make an early decision. Mr. Hussey points out it's been around since 2013 and before that, so I, I hope to make an early decision. But I haven't made a decision yet. First, Alfred is not in his place. Uh, Aaron, Sir Catherine Seely, I call Catherine. Seely. ever a shake. Thank you. Question number six, please. Well, Gurum, uh, I got a, a, a call to. I've already had an initial discussion with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, uh, where I expressed my strong opposition to the austerity agenda. Uh, as members may be aware, as I just mentioned, we are facing a real term reduction of 4.5% in our resource deal by 2019 20. On top of this, uh, I also indicated my desire in talking with the, sec the, the, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to have a working relationship. So. And I think that's important. We may be on different sides in many arguments, but I think we also have to have a working and productive relationship. Uh, I have no doubt that in, in the short time ahead, uh, we will intensify our negotiations, not only with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, but also with, with Chancellor Osborne. Um, a letter went off to, to Chancellor Osborne last week in relation to corporation tax, but that covers other issues as well I had written to him on. So, um, I actually think it's very important that we have a productive, fruitful uh, relationship with Minister Noonan and his colleagues in Dublin, but also with our, with our colleagues in, in Wales and Scotland as well as with Treasury. So uh, to, to, it's early days, but I hope it will be a very regular contact, but I hope as well to make sure that I represent uh, robustly everyone who votes for the members who are gathered here today. Catherine Seeley for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his response. And, um, this is my first opportunity to wish him well in his new role. Can I ask the Minister what was discussed during meetings with the Finance Ministers of Scotland and Wales? 
Can I ask the Minister to make his answer very brief because okay. we have to move to well, topical. Uh, in Wales we discussed a little bit of football, but it didn't go well for them. Um, and in Scotland they, they avoided football. I think with Derek Mackey, the Finance Minister of Scotland, it was let's have a, a, a really regular working relationship and it's, it's with Mark Drakeford, the Finance Minister of Wales, it was the same. And this was the big point. Together we represent 10 million people. So when we make a point to the Treasury about raiding our coffers or not being fair and proportionate, we speak for 10 million people. And that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, the, yep, the Minister's party has previously supported the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service being reclassified as a frontline service when it comes to budgetary decisions being taken. Uh, can the Minister tell us whether this remains his position? And I, of course, declare an interest as a former fire officer up until uh, last month. Thank you. Well, uh, I thank the member for his question. Out of the frying pan and into, or, or the fire into the frying pan, or the frying pan into the fire. Um, you're welcome here. And, and of course, we had one of the most, uh, I thought, evocative moments of the last assembly mandate was when the firefighters came here, and we saw what a real lobby looks like. Uh, I, I don't have the full details on that issue, but you can take it that we consider the fire service to be absolutely vital uh, to our society, that it is a service that we stand behind. I am happy for the Minister of Health, who is also responsible for the, for the fire service, to come forward with proposals, and you can be sure of this, that they will receive a sympathetic ear. Butler for supplement. Thank you that, for that considerate response, Minister. Um, in a motion earlier this year, the, the Assembly passed an Ulster Unionist call for the Executive not to risk uh, just public safety, but also those of my former comrades in, in the service, uh, whilst I was also there. Will the Minister give a commitment uh, himself to work with the Fire and Rescue Service along with the Fire Brigade Union in the run-up to the next budget? Well, well, absolutely, and, and I think that was the, the day in which, which I was referring to, and I, and I think we voted for that motion. And it shows you the strength of a, of a very powerful lobby when, when 100 uh, firefighters arrive at the Assembly, you usually uh, are, are, are tremendously supportive of what they were asking for. So yes, it remains a priority for me. It's not my department. Um, budgets are under pressure, but you can take it from me that the fire service is an integral part, vital part, key part of everything we do, and I know that you will be a, a strong advocate for our firefighters in the time ahead. Rosemary Barton for a, for a question. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister provide an update on the rationalisation of the arm's length bodies, especially now after the reduction in the number of executive departments? Well, um, I thank Mrs. Barton for, for her question. It has formed uh, an early part of the briefings I've received is the arm's length bodies, uh, our commitment to reform them, and for what it's worth, it's a commitment in the Sinn Féin manifesto before the election as well. Uh, I don't think there's anyone in the House who doesn't believe we could do a better job of rationalising the arm, arm's length bodies. Um, at this stage, I have no particular recommendations to make. Of course, many of those uh, arm's length bodies don't come under my department uh, and are responsible and, and report to other bodies. Um, but I, 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 I I think the member will agree with this. If we can find a way to deliver the same level of service or improve it with a more mainstreamed uh, delivery uh, system, I think she would support that. So, while respecting the independence of the arm's length bodies, and, and I do believe that every one of them fills a vital role, uh, I'm also open to looking at ways of, and, and some, of the, some of the bodies themselves, some of the agencies are up, up to this as well, looking at ways in which we can get a, a bigger bang for our buck. But, Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's make sure that we um, advance in a way which includes everyone, that it values everyone and recognises the contribution of, of those arms like bodies uh, in the past and in, in the future. Rosemary Barton for a supplement. Minister, thank you for your response. However, given the emphasis that the 211 budget placed on this rationalisation only for nothing to happen in reality, can the Minister explain whether the Budget Review Group is now effectively dead in the water? I thank the Member for supplementary. Um, I, I haven't been here since 2011, and uh, so I can't, you can't visit all the sins of my fathers and mothers upon me, but I, I, take the point, I take the point that there's been much promise and not enough action. Uh, so it is a live issue. Don't, don't consider it moribund or dormant. 
It is an issue to which we will return, and I think it's uh, an issue in which all the members of the House, including yourself, will have input uh, to make. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I look forward to that. But certainly there's, there's work to be done, and 2011-2016, in, in, in my view, has, has been too long. But I know the executive is committed to making progress on this. And now that we have moved, as, you, as the member says, from 12 to 9 departments, I think now is an opposite time. Aaron, sir, or Richie McPhillips. I call thank, Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. The Minister will be well aware that increasing business rates for small businesses is a major concern in my constituency of Fermanagh South Tyrone. In light of this, can the Minister detail if he has any plans to review the small business rates relief scheme or system in order for more, to be more accessible to SMEs? Well, I, I thank the member for his question. I know that in, in Fermanagh in particular, he has uh, voiced concerns about the, I suppose, the retail economy or the grassroots economy and the pressures that it's under. He can be assured that, that I share those uh, concerns, and it's my intention to give as much help as possible to small business. But we, we have had a review of small business rates. We're in, into a larger review, really, of, of the entire rating system, and I've been meeting with uh, my officials on this. I would like to bring forward uh, proposals which are perhaps a little bit bolder. Uh, he'll be aware of, a, uh, of uh, when I met the Chief Executive of Fermanagh Council recently, he pointed to me a, a, a site beside Brewster Park, which has been empty for I don't know how long, I think 20 years, uh, and talked about you know, an economic asset, productive asset, uh, being lost. And of course, it doesn't come under rates at all. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give the member this assurance. Without small businesses, without small to medium-sized enterprises, we don't have an economy. So we need to have prosperous main streets, prosperous towns and prosperous cities. And we need to ensure that the, the, the spray and pray approach of, of business rate relief for small business, for me, isn't making enough difference. So uh, with the member's uh, permission, I hope to bring forward perhaps uh, proposals which perhaps I might say would be more focused in the time ahead. I call Richie McPhillips for supplementary. I thank the Minister, Minister for his answer. Can the Minister also confirm as to whether, as part of the proposals of reform for non-domestic rates, whether he will impose rates on charity shops? Well, it's not, um, and I thank him for the supplementary, it's not, it's not my intention to impose rates on charity shops, but I am aware of the difficulty it presents to us when landlords who, a landlord who may be unscrupulous, who doesn't want to pay half rates, 50 per cent rate, because there's 50 per cent relief on a, an empty premises, that he or she decides to put a charity in uh, and therefore uh, avoids the rate obligation uh, while charging the charity rent. And that there, there is a problem, I think, in some of our busiest commercial main streets that we need to prevent landlords from doing that. I, I, I've, been, I've met the charities. Um, it, is, it is going to be part, I think, of a wider review. At this stage, I think, and I met, I met Nick Finn Friday, Friday, our friends in the, in the NI Council for Family Reaction, and this is one of the topics. I think most charities want to, want to make a contribution, and they make their contribution through the, the wider charitable works. But at the same time, we need to make sure that our high streets prosper. So uh, I'm sure the member has a view on this. Is there a time when we say there's five charity shops in the street? Is that enough? Or is it, well, if, if there, there can be six, there can be seven? Because I know from my constituency at South Belfast, sometimes traders come to me and say, you know, the balance is wrong because people are saying we can't shop here. On the other hand, of course, every one of those charities, I feel last quarterly makes a great contribution. So I look forward to hearing the members' views on that matter as well in the time ahead. Sir, Claire Hanna. I call Claire. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the Minister for his question so far. Uh, the Minister might be aware of a speech made in the Doyle last Wednesday by Micheál Martin when, in his words, he said there is something rotten in the state of Denmark and that new evidence would likely emerge in relation to the sale of the NAMA loan portfolio. Does the Minister agree with Deputy Martin that the nothing-to-see uh, attitude from governments is no longer tenable? Well, um I, I didn't catch all of Michal Martin's uh, speech, but I'm sure, as the member is aware, his government was uh, deeply involved in the issues and problems in Christ, which led to the setting up of NAMA and left us with this uh, mess, uh, this corrosive mess, which, which has been the NAMA and the NAMA loan book and Project Eagle. Um, I think the pledge I would give her is that I will release, my department will release all the information we can to her. Um, that, that I view uh, the, the NAMA scandal as an abomination, that the public is entitled to know if anyone uh, benefited from the misery 
of so many people, many people caught in negative equity, many people who did lose, lose properties. Uh, and in the, in the time ahead, whether it's Michal Martin or anyone else, I think I can say what we have said previously, that the Irish government uh, needs to do more. And uh, there, there have been calls for a legislative commission of inquiry, and I think we really need that, that those of us uh, in the Department of Finance or in other bodies here will do our best to provide the information, but I really do think it's time for the Irish government to do more, and I hope that happens in the time ahead, and I presume that's what, my, what, what former Minister Martin was speaking about. Claire Hanna for a supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for that uh, comprehensive answer. In fact, can the Minister outline uh, what information his department will be releasing uh, in response to the request from the Finance Committee uh, to release previously redacted or withheld information? Well, well, well yes, I can, and, and you, you'll be seeing later today, I hope when the uh, papers go out to the Finance Committee, that I will honour my pledge, that I will re release all the information that I have in my department relating to NAMA. As I said, I'm on the same side of the, whatever side of the table I'm at with the committee. Uh, my uh, pledge remains the same, that any information relevant uh, to the NAMA inquiry should be released to the committee. So today, I have gone back, as I promised, looked at the documents that had been released previously, removed redactions which were there. Uh, there are very few minor redactions which the committee didn't ask for, for example, bank employees who were worried about their jobs. But I have removed the redactions, and I hope you receive those fresh papers uh, later today. There has been an attempt uh, to prevent me from releasing one piece of information. Um, it is my resolve, uh, regardless of that attempt, which we take seriously and, and we need to take counsel over the next 24 hours, I repeat my pledge to you at committee. It's my resolve to release that piece of information to you as well, because I believe that is also in the public interest. I call William Irwin for a question. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister to confirm that the Northern Ireland share of the EU money is decreasing year on year? Well, uh, I think this is a loaded question uh, for you, Lars Concordia. Funny, I, I, read, I read the figures uh, this morning, and uh, they are staggering. The peace monies, the interreg monies, the RDF monies that have come into this part of the world are absolutely staggering. I think almost €2 billion Euros in peace money. Interreg money, I think, is up around €1.2 billion. So uh, I know you have great faith in at Westminster. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure why, but uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If I were a batting man, I wouldn't be. Uh, I wouldn't be batting on our friends in, in the Treasury being as generous uh, post Brexit if that were to happen. And please God, it doesn't. Uh, as they are, as they are, as they are letting, letting on. So um, yes, peace. The peace monies are. Uh, the programme is coming to an end. I think 2021 will see the end of Peace, peace uh, Four. But uh, we need to, we need to, I think, double down, go back to Europe, and say this isn't a time to be post Friday, if circumstances permitting, going back to Europe and saying, in fact, now is the time to reinforce your commitment rather than uh, decreasing your commitment to building the peace and prosperity here. I call William Irwin for supplementary. Can I thank the minister for? I'm not sure we've got an answer or not there. But can the minister, can, given that the UK government pays in the region of 20 billion? Into Europe each year and year on year, uh, we our payments and money uh, funding from Europe is reduced. Can the minister understand why support for the leaving leaving Europe is growing? Well, I'm, I'm very respectful of anyone who wants to vote uh, to leave on Thursday, but for the life of me, I can't understand how anyone in this part of the world would vote to leave. Because for the last 15 years, I have heard politicians from both sides of this House, all sides of the House, say that the foreign direct investment should come here, not only because we have great talented people, but because we are a gateway to Europe. And in fact, in my view, our future prosperity, future success of business, but in particular the foreign direct investment we used to attract through corporation tax, is predicated, predicated, and I'm, you're making me talk about Brexit, which I'm, which I, I foresaw not to do, uh, is predicated upon our, our membership of the European Union. <laughs> Thank you. Sir Carl Nicolin, I call Carl Nicolin. Last can call you just on the European theme, if, uh, if you may. Uh, what possibilities are there for even using projects like the Nar Water Bridge to lever in additional European funding? And not even that, which is an excellent example of peace and reconciliation projects. Other examples where uh, European funding will actually make the project viable? Well, Carol, my goodness, and Kesh, Carol, because she didn't get digging to the fast to cut out that because the Takiak no horrible the number at our bond. But I think that uh, the member understands the 
key importance of Europe's support for everything we're trying to do here in terms of building the peace and building prosperity. Uh, I think it's, a, it's a, an opposite time on Friday. I hope it's, we, we have an opportunity to go back to Europe and say this is, this is how you have to win the hearts and minds of people, even more so uh, by, by reinforcing your commitment to the peace process. The European project was born out of a wish to see an end to war, and I think that's one reason why the uh, European Union really understood the importance of our peace process. They got it, and they responded generously. And I hope that in the time ahead, not just in narrow water, but in many other uh, projects, including entrepreneurial projects, research and innovation, life sciences, that we will continue to have strong uh, support from our European colleagues. Um, done supplementary. Um, members, you will wish to take your ease while we change the table. That ends question time.